Okay, so thanks all for coming along tonight and attending, and I'm really glad we are here together. Um, in terms of who I am and why I'm standing here, I mean, you'll maybe get some sense of that through the lecture, but briefly, my current position is that I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Oxford at the Centre for Criminology, um, and I previously was a barrister, and there are lots of other bits of my life too, and you might hear about some of that. So I read Rebecca Solnit's essay, Hope in the Dark, on the subject of climate crisis about a year ago. I was off work with secondary trauma, which was a consequence of 10 years of research into the sentencing of mothers and the criminalization of women. And I was in a very uncertain place. And when I read this line from the essay, I was gripped. She wrote, hope locates itself in the premise that we don't know what will happen and that in the spaciousness of uncertainty is the room to act. Now, Rebecca Solnit's reframing of uncertainty as a place of hope and spaciousness opened up an entirely new perspective to me and gave me the title for tonight's lecture. Now, I don't know who you are or why you've come tonight, but I expect that we all have a common interest in or concerns about the prisons in this country or in other countries around the world. We may have questions or worries about what is expected of prisons or for the people who live and work in them, and perhaps we have a shared wish that they were different to they are. Prisons are overcrowded, courts are unable to cope with the workload, and victims' concerns go unheeded. And as populist punitive rhetoric gathers momentum, it would be easy to feel hopeless. And in Prisons Week, which is coming up, it's hardly the elephant in the room, but rather the loudly spoken truth that prisons harm rather than rehabilitate. <coughs> Our system of punishment often seems to lack justice in the broader sense. The evidence is overwhelming that reoffending is increased by prison time. And our prison system and all those who live and work in it are under increasing strain. We are living in very uncertain times, and criminal justice policy and practice is part of that uncertainty. <coughs> now, as you've heard from Paul, I'm giving this lecture in the context of the 200th anniversary of the Liverpool Diocesan Charity for Social Aid, or Adelaide House, which is easier to say. The services and opportunities for women made possible by Adelaide House came about because Anne Waterhouse and her husband Nicholas, the founders of the charity, were visited by Anne's cousin, a woman named Elizabeth Fry. We don't know the substance of their meeting or the nature of their relationship or the way the conversation unfolded, but we do know that because of Elizabeth's visit, Anne and Nicholas decided to make provision for women in the city of Liverpool through Adelaide House. Now, having spent the past 10 years as an activist academic working on matters related to women in prison and their children, and knowing how hard it is to get anyone interested and committed to making proper provision for criminalised women, when I heard about the origins of Adelaide House, I wanted to know what it was about Betsy Fry, as she was known to her friends and family, that enabled her to persuade her cousin in Liverpool to change her life in order to prioritise women in her own prison. Until I began to read up on Elizabeth Fry, all I knew was that she was a penal reformer a long time ago, and her face was on the five pound note for a time. And I won't ask if any of you know more than that, or if that's your extent of knowledge as well. But having learned about her over the past uh, weeks, I'm actually close to getting her face tattooed on me somewhere as an homage, <laughs> because that is how bold over I am by her. So tonight I want to reflect on the way that Elizabeth Fry found hope and reason to act in the spaciousness of uncertainty. So let's go back to 1780. Betsy was born into a wealthy Quaker family, and Quakers are members of the Religious Society of Friends, which had its beginnings as a Protestant Christian tradition, believing in the presence of God in every person, <coughs> and key values of simplicity, truth, equality, and peace. Betsy's family weren't plain Quakers, they were rather more fun and colourful Quakers, and her early years, although saddened by the death of her beloved mother, were full of family, adventures, and high society. She loved the theatre, was extremely attractive, and drew the attention of many men, meaning that despite having older sisters, she was the first to receive the marriage proposals. She and her sisters did not embrace faith with enthusiasm. They called the Quaker meetings dis, as in, I don't want to go to dis today, and dis was short for disgusting. <laughs> However, at the age of 18, she was profoundly affected by the preaching of a Quaker minister who was visiting from the United States. Something in what he said made sense of the longing she had for greater meaning in her life. For months she followed him to wherever he was speaking, attracting the mockery of her sisters. There probably was something of an infatuation about it, 
But Betsy's engaged in a really deeply thoughtful consideration of her future. Should she become a plain Quaker, setting aside worldly things to be more focused on matters of faith and belief? Betsy made her decision and at the age of 18 chose faith. She began to spend more of her time doing activities that had always mattered to her, such as helping people around her, but now they became her primary focus. She was aware that many children around the family's estate couldn't read or write. <coughs> and although she herself had not excelled at education and in fact had problems with spelling and grammar, she decided to offer lessons to children. Beginning with just a few, she soon had a school of 50. She made provision for the families doing what she could for the mothers by way of food and clothing. And her father began to realize, it's noted through some writings of his, that through these actions that she was quite serious about her new convictions, which centered on the necessity of salvation and the individual value of every person. He found himself admiring the woman she was becoming rather than grieving the son daughter he felt he had lost. Soon Betsy married Joseph Fry, a Quaker who she'd already turned on twice, but he asked again and she eventually accepted that his seriousness about her was not something she should walk away from. So at the age of 20, Betsy found marriage and the move to London really difficult. A life in which her primary focus was entertaining people and being entertained didn't suit her and she also had difficult relations with her in-laws. Her first child was born in 1801, after a very traumatic and difficult birth. And over the course of her next 23 years, she gave birth to 12 children and had several miscarriages. Now for many women of her generation, that would have been her life in its totality, a wife, mother, organizer of the household. But those were not to be Betsy's only contributions to society. She had a gift for preaching and felt called by God to minister in that way. So she became a minister in the Society of Friends. Her sisters, very pre uh, prevalent in Betsy's life, was their disapproval, and they disapproved of that as well. <laughs> and although she felt really strongly that, that it was a vocation, she was constantly aware that she was not fulfilling other people's expectations of her as a woman. After 12 years of married life and with eight children, her husband's bank was near to collapse. Her brothers bailed him out and structured their finances to protect their sister's family. Decisions were made about Betsy by her husband and her brothers, and her four older children were taken to live with her siblings, and she was left with the four youngest. She felt judgments were being made about the inadequacy of her parenting. She felt she was a failure, and she felt ashamed. And it was from this context, age 33, that she stepped into the next phase of her life's work, and that part of her life, which I think will be of interest to everyone gathered here. In February 1813, two men called at her house in London. They'd just left Newgate Jail, and Betsy Fry was the closest Quaker woman they knew to that terrible place, and they desperately needed to unburden themselves to someone whose sympathy they could count on. The men had gone to the visit of the jail and had seen the men, but when they tried to visit the women's yard, the jailers didn't want to let them in. When the men did enter, they were shaken by what they saw, and they described the women's yard at Newgate as the most violent de depravity and despair present in that place. Hearing from the men there were children in the prison with their mothers, Betsy, mother to eight children, one of them only a few months old, went the next day with a friend to Newgate Prison with clothes for their babies. Initially the women were told, like the men the previous day, that they couldn't deliver the gifts. The governor, Mr Newman, told them the sights and smells would be too much for them, and even if they could tolerate those, they'd be attacked by the women. Betsy and her friend Anna were persistent. They emphasised their wealthy families, influential connections, and Betsy recorded in her journal that they finally wore him down. The governor hadn't exaggerated the horrific nature of the prison conditions. As they walked through the prison where 300 women were held in terrible conditions, the noises and smells caused both women to feel nauseous. Betsy described feeling her flesh crawl and a cold sweat break out. She felt as if she was walking into a nightmare. The turnkey accompanying them remarked that he and his associates never went into the women's area as they were too frightened. He once again advised Betsy she shouldn't take the risk of going in. She said she'd come to clothe the babies and she wasn't leaving until she'd done that. He let Betsy and Anna into the yard and bolted the door behind them and they saw hundreds of women. Few were properly clothed because women were made to pay for the keep and if on arrival they had no money, they had to sell their clothes to the jailer. All were dirty, some were drunk, lice crawled through their hair. Betsy and Anna stood in the middle of the yard whilst women surged around them. Betsy recorded in her journal that as she returned their gaze, though she saw insolence, wantonness, confusion and despair, 
she also saw a terrible and godless hopelessness. Betsy and Anna set to work at clothing the babies. Many were very cold, so Betsy held them until their bodies were warmed. For three days they returned to the prison, clothing all the children in Newgate and making beds of fresh straw for the women who were sick. It was recorded that before they left on the third day, Betsy and Anna knelt on the filthy floor of the yard and prayed for those who lived in the prison. Women knelt around them and both Betsy and Anna wept, as did many of the women in the yard. One of the greatest things about Betsy was her almost total inability to see the world divided into us and them. And it was so powerfully demonstrated on that first visit to Newgate. She was a woman with babies, and she wanted to make sure that other women with babies had what they needed. She wanted children to be warm and clothed. It didn't matter whose children they were. She understood what it was to be a person made in the image of God. And part of that is knowing that all people are made in the image of God. When I read the account of that visit, I wept too. And maybe I was just feeling a bit emotional. But I think I saw a glimpse of the extraordinary power that comes from identifying with other people in our shared humanity. And the possibilities for all of us that can flow from that. It also held for me an echo of the opening of my eyes to the difficulties faced by children whose mothers were in prison. Although mine took place in the quiet of a university library and not in a prison yard. I originally trained and worked as a barrister representing clients in the criminal and family courts. I developed a specialist practice in care cases where the local authority bring proceedings to remove a child from their family because of the harm or likelihood of harm being suffered by the child due to abuse or neglect. These decisions were never <coughs> taken lightly and involved multiple court hearings, extensive assessments of parenting and thorough consideration by multiple professionals, including a guardian ad litem acting on the child's behalf, to determine what course of action was in the child's best interest. That principle is set out in Section 1.1 of the Children Act 1989, where it states that the child's welfare there is the paramount consideration of the court. When I had my own children, I could no longer work as a barrister. Childcare costs versus income didn't allow for it, even though I am only three and not 12, like Betsy. So I turned from my hand to other things for several years, mostly justice related. And in 2011, I found myself in a university library trying to find out what happened to the children of women who were imprisoned. I can only imagine that they faced what they would experience as a catastrophic loss with all the consequences of that. But I had assumed that similar to the treatment of children separated from their parents by the state in the family courts, there would be some provision for them and careful consideration of how separation would impact them. I became increasingly uncomfortable as my assumption that I'd find details of this provision came to naught. It seemed there was no requirement then on courts to even ask if a woman had children, let alone ensure they would be properly looked after if their mother went to prison. As I came to the realisation that no one seemed to care about the children of women in prison, I sat at a desk in the library with my head in my hands and I wept. I was devastated by the lack of concern for that group of children. My Christian faith, like Betsy's, holds at the centre the intrinsic worth of every person and turned out to be a driving force for me to do something to alleviate the harm that I couldn't ignore. Picking up Betsy's story, <coughs> she didn't return to Newgate Prison for more than three years. Her life was full of personal complications and sadness. She gave birth to two more children and experienced the death of one of her older daughters, called Betsy. Her husband's bank was rescued from failure by her family for a second time, and the consequence of that was that six of her children were taken by her siblings. Several of her close family members died, and she <laughs> continued to work to feed and clothe the poor around her. She ministered at friends' meetings, and she had, as since childhood, uh, long periods where she suffered from the blackness of depression, which she managed with occasional periods of rest and alcohol. Her brother wrote to her, have no scruples about the third and fourth class being a little inconsistent with the expected proceedings of public friends. When Betsy returned to Newgate at the end of 1816, the turnkey didn't want to let her into the women's yard, but she insisted. Left alone, she did feel frightened, as many of the women were drunk and seemed to see her as a threat. As she began to panic, she prayed for help and saw a woman holding a little girl. She walked to them and took the child into her arms, placed her hand on the mother's shoulder and turned to the women surging towards her and said, is there not something we can do for these little children? Now maybe it was because she'd asked the women for the, their thoughts on how the future might be different. Maybe it was her gentleness, her lack of agenda. Maybe it was prayer. But something in that afternoon brought Betsy and the women of Newgate together 
and from that came a plan that the children of women in Newgate could be given some education. Although those in charge were against it, Betsy asked them to let her try it as an experiment. The women made a cell available and chose a teacher, a young woman called Mary Connor, who had been a previously, previously respectable woman convicted for stealing a watch. 30 children, many of them born in prison, were crammed into a cell to receive basic education. It was the first school in British prison history. Once the school took its first scholars, more women placed their children on the waiting list. And then the women asked for education for themselves. They wanted to be taught to read and to sew. They wanted to leave prison with skills that wouldn't leave them dependent on men for money from begging, stealing, or prostitution. Betsy recorded in her journal very honestly that she felt very unsure about taking the idea forward, even though she thought it was something that should happen. She didn't relish the opposition of men in authority. Who of us does? She didn't want to be criticised further for spending time on things other than her family. She questioned if pride was leading her astray, or if God was calling her forward. From her journal notes, she recognised that what she did in Newgate would prove critical, and there would be no turning from it. Betsy decided to press forward with an attempt to set up a workshop in prison, and was shocked when her own brothers and friends, themselves involved in prison reform, wouldn't support her in it. They, like the governors, believed the women to be unteachable. One of them said, the materials will be stolen or destroyed, scissors and needles will become weapons, and the workshop would be overtaken by riot. But having committed herself to the plan, Betsy tried a different tack. In April 1817, she established the Association for the Improvement of the Female Prisoners in Newgate. Its membership was 11 Quaker women and the wife of an Anglican clergyman. Its object was to provide for the clothing, instruction, and employment of the women, to introduce them to a knowledge of the Holy Scriptures, and to form in them, as much as possible, those habits of order, sobriety, and industry which may render them docile and peaceful whilst in prison and respectable when they leave it. The 12 members pledged to visit the prison, pay the salary of a resident matron, and provide for necessary materials and arrange for sales and work. Betsy did need a man's support, and Joseph Fry, her husband, invited all the men in charge of Newgate to dinner at their home. During that dinner, he told them how much he supported his wife's endeavour. Good man. The governor was unconvinced, but agreed to attend a meeting with the 70 women who were going to form part of this experiment. The first meeting took place on another some days later. The women had agreed to abide by a set of rules. That was a condition of the experiment set by the governor. But what the women weren't expecting was that these rules will be drawn up by them in association with the ladies. So a set of 12 rules were agreed, many of them setting up structures for self-determination within the workshops, a division of classes, each with monitor monitors responsible for supervising other women. Two weeks later, with the workshop well underway, the Reverend C.B. Taylor, who previously described New Newgate Women's Yard as hell above ground, wrote this about the women he observed working. Their countenances wore an air of self-respect and gravity, a sort of consciousness of their improved character and the altered position in which they were placed. Now there are several important things for us to note in how Betsy progressed matters. She recognised the dignity of the women in Newgate. She listened to them when they told her what they needed. And she then used her influence, connections and uncriminalised status to put into place support and improvements for them. She didn't work alone. She found others who shared her vision and values, and between them, they carried the work. She felt the discomfort of her non-conformity to societal roles, but she lived authentically and with great courage. Now, I don't have time to tell you all that Betsy accomplished in the remaining 28 years of her life, but if I tell you that her children complained that holidays with her were exhausting and tiresome because she had an inability to ignore prisons or evangelistic opportunities, you will have a sense of how she lived her life. But in brief, her work at Newgate carried on and extended beyond the prison itself. As well as being instrumental in achieving reforms such as segregation of the sexes in prison, female matrons for female prisoners, the provision of education and employment, she inspected prisons, drafted reports for Parliament, was the first woman to appear before a parliamentary select committee to give evidence, advocated reform and established new campaigning groups. Her work on convict ships is of note. At the time when women in Newgate were deported to Australia, they were brought in open carriages from the prison, through crowds who lined the street, and pelted them with rotten food. This frightened the women so much that often the night before they were moved to the ships, they would riot in Newgate. Betsy persuaded the governor to send the women in closed carriages, and she and the other ladies of the association travelled with them as a sign of solidarity. 
She negotiated with ship's captains that women and children should be allocated a food and water allowance, which wasn't the standard procedure. And we provided them a bag of provisions, including books and sewing materials, so that when they landed, the women would have something to sell, rather than immediately being taken into sexual servitude. In a 12-year period, this is astonishing, she visited every convict ship before it left England. She was also involved in improving nursing standards, establishing soup kitchens and homeless shelters, campaigning against the death penalty, and her thoughts on prison reform were sought in Prussia, Italy, France, the Netherlands, and Germany. And this is all in the early 1800s. Betsy Fry was, as they say in Ireland, some woman for one woman. It's hard to fully grasp the extent of her influence in prison and penal reform across the world. Now, I've been asked to share a little of my own journeys that follows on from Betsy Fry and her concern for children whose mothers were impressed. And I'll tell you now, it's nowhere near as impressive as hers. My moment in the university library led me to applying at the age of 39 with only three primary age children to do a PhD exploring the considerations given to children when mothers were sentenced. The title was Who Cares? Because I wasn't sure that anyone did. I suppose, like Betsy, I saw a problem and I threw all that I had at trying to solve it. And in the process, I became an entirely <coughs> accidental academic and accidental penal reformer. As I said earlier, I realised there was differentiated treatment of children separated from their parents in the family courts and those by imprisonment. And I knew that I needed to have robust research evidence in order to advocate for change. So I interviewed judges about their sentencing practice, children about their experience of having a mum in prison, and reviewed case law and sentencing guidelines. And I found that although there were guidelines and there was some case law that suggested children should be considered when sentencing primary carers, that wasn't always happening in practice. And children suffered an extraordinary range of harms when their mothers were imprisoned. After the completion of my PhD research, which is published as a book, should you be interested in reading it, I got funding to make training resources for all legal professionals involved in the sentencing of mothers, judiciary, magistracy, probation staff and lawyers, and I gave training to many professional groups. I took my research to the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Human Rights and asked them to hold an inquiry into the rights of children whose mothers are imprisoned. I was a little bit surprised to find that almost 200 years, 201 years to the day after Betsy Fry was the first woman to give evidence on that topic, I gave evidence to the Human Rights Committee. The committee found that the rights of children were indeed being breached and made several recommendations to the government. Although all were accepted, they haven't yet been acted on, um, which is clearly disappointing. But partly because of that inquiry, the Sentencing Council then developed new guidelines which set out that courts should always consider the impact of a sentence on dependent children. Of course, it doesn't always mean it happens, but it's progress. I've worked with judiciary in Scotland, Northern Ireland, New Zealand, the Pacific Islands and other European countries to ensure children are considered when women are sentenced. And more recently I've been involved in working to see the abolition of the imprisonment of pregnant women, as prison is not a safe place for an unborn child or its mother. I worked without much success at all to get government to improve communication for prisoners with their families during the COVID lockdowns. And currently I'm looking at procedural justice for women in prison and their ability to participate properly in proceedings in court concerning their children. So Betsy did her thing, and I'm doing mine, and many of you are doing yours. But I have to say I find it painful to see how little has changed in two centuries. We have separate facilities for women. Women in prison receive education and are clothed. There is healthcare and bedding. There are children, <coughs> other than some babies under the age of 18 months, are not in prison with them. They aren't pelted with rotten food on their way to convict ships, nor are they sentenced to death for stealing a check. But although prisons may no longer smell or feel so dangerous, the stench of harm is ever present, and the pain in them can feel visceral. In the past year, approximately 5,000 women were imprisoned in England and Wales. This is twice as many as 30 years ago. Many of those women have not yet been found guilty of a crime or have not been sentenced. And ultimately, more than 50% of these women not yet found guilty of sentence are not given, are, are given non-custodial sentences. Nearly 70% of women sentenced to imprisonment have committed non-violent offences. TV licence evasion was the most common offence for women to be convicted of in 2019. There is an increase in the use of short prison sentences. 76% of women in prison have been sentenced to less than two years in prison, meaning they stay there for one year. And two thirds are sentenced to less than six months, meaning a three month jail period. 20 years ago, it was less than a third who were sentenced to less than six months. So those sentences, short sentences, are increasing. 
Now, any sentence under two years can be suspended, and the crimes punished by these short sentences may well have been less serious and may have been uh, crimes that could have been punished in the community rather in than in prison. But the use of community sentences has dropped by 61% in a decade. The overuse of short sentences of imprisonment may mean that a woman can lose her children, her home, her job, and she has little prospect of getting any of those back when she finishes her sentence. When women appeal their sentences, approximately 46% of those appeals are successful. High numbers of women in prison have mental health problems, many have a problem with alcohol or drugs, 53% have experienced emotional, sexual or physical abuse, and a third have spent time in state care as a child. A quarter have no previous convictions prior to being sent to prison. Prison is still an incredibly stressful place to be. Self-harm rates in prison for women have reached a record high. Prison does not rehabilitate and it does not prevent future offending. Women who've received a prison sentence rather than a community sentence are more likely to reoffend. 58% of women leaving prison are reconvicted within one year, and this rises to 73% for those sentenced to less than 12 months. Why is this? Well, some answer may be found in the fact that only 4% of women are in paid employment six weeks after release, and less than half of the women leaving prison leave to settled accommodation. I was really fortunate to spend time in Adelaide House today, and that was what came up as the big issue. Accommodation, where are these women supposed to live when they come out of prison? Who is providing housing? Without housing, there are a lot of things that you're vulnerable to, vulnerable to exploitation, further reoffending, and you're not able to access lots of other things that would bring good. I often wonder what we as a society think we're achieving when we lock people up. And it would be easy to be overwhelmed by the problems and disappointed that the pace of change is so slow. And now that I've brought us all down again, we're going to go back to my new hero, Betsy. I admire and respect all that she did, and I'm really glad that she did it. And I'm trying to understand why she kept going with the work that she did. She didn't do it because she had time in her hands. Twelve children, 25 grandchildren, and the caring burden of many friends and relatives fell to her. She didn't do it without it affecting her. Exhaustion and depression were the backdrop to much of her life. She drank too much and worried about it. She felt constantly guilty when she chose work over family. She didn't do it because it brought her affirmation. A preacher of the day said of her, we long to burn her alive. <laughs> and her own family often questioned her choices. She didn't do it because she had it all together and she always got things right. She experienced plenty of failures, disappointments and public shame in her personal life. And she didn't do it because she had the skills or the standing or the influence. So, what allowed Betsy to hold on to hope and to keep going despite all the uncertainties? I think it was two things. I think it was her imagination and her faith. Even as a small child, she'd had a vivid and often terrifying imagination. And I suspect it was this powerful imagination that allowed her to see how things could be different and to have deep empathy for people. She wasn't ever curtailed by the status quo. She could always see different ways of doing things. And her work was to infuse, cajole, and persuade other people to try out her ideas. And then her faith, that set the parameters of her life. It drove her to care for others on both an eternal and immediate basis. When she preached, she didn't ever say you, she said us. The challenges, promises, and blessing of the gospel were for her and for everyone she met. She believed that she had been saved from death and darkness and that every person was both worth saving and savable. As she herself said, there just had to be a person to act as a catalyst for change. So I can't help but wonder, what would she see if she walked into our prisons and courts today? Where would her imagination take her? Where can our imagination and our faith take us? If you could draw up a list of the things you'd like to change, what would be on it? So here's my imaginative hope list. I'd like to see a reduction in the use of imprisonment. I'd like us to stop sending women to prison for short terms. If a crime carries a penalty of less than two years imprisonment, it should be punished with a suspended sentence or a community penalty. Use problem-solving courts. These courts support people through the period of their sentence, and having seen them used for women in Manchester, I saw women flourishing rather than fading. I'd love to see more of them. Use diversion. Many people should never be arrested, charged, or convicted. Their offending, if it is that, is due to systemic issues such as poverty, poor housing, addiction, or health. <coughs> Give people support, don't punish them. 
There's recent research showing that young women who've been in state care are much more likely to end up being criminalised, as are young women who've been excluded from school. There needs to be special attention to pay to see why this is happening. And we need to work to find different ways to manage the behaviours that often show up out of loneliness, confusion and fear, but are treated as wrongness, which needs punished. While prisons do increase, do exist, and increasingly I do find myself moving to an abolitionist perspective, they need to be resourced properly. But we shouldn't be creating more prison spaces, we should be trying to empty our prisons. I'd like to see people's understandings of the law and punishment of prisons become better informed, <coughs> so that they can understand that prisons are not something that actually do us good as a society, certainly not as they currently are. There are so many individuals who believe in these things, who hope for change and who keep stepping into uncertainty. And many of you tonight here are those people, and I am so grateful for you, for your determination, your dedication, and your unwillingness to lose hope. Rachel Brett, the now retired representative for Human Rights and Refugees at the Quaker United Nations office in Geneva, is one of those people. A brilliant lawyer and a committed Quaker, I've had the privilege of knowing her for the past 10 years. And a few years ago, when I was finding things really hard, not seeing any positive responses from government when I lobbied them for the changes I wanted to see for children, I asked Rachel how she kept going, seeking change in criminal justice and human rights, when so often it feels as though all you are doing is banging your head on a brick wall. Shona, she said, working for change is like a game of snakes and ladders. The only possible way to succeed is to stay on board. We can see looking back at history that change is possible and it does occur. And today we are the catalyst for change and it is holy work. I end with a description of Betsy from her brother Joseph John Gurney. The law of love, which might be said to be ever on her lips, was deeply engraved on her heart. And her charity, in the best and most comprehensive sense of the term, flowed freely forth towards her fellow men of every class, of every condition. Thus, with a peculiar grace, she won her way and almost uniformly obtained her object. This perseverance was combined with a peculiar versatility and readiness for seizing on every passing occasion and converting it into an opportunity of usefulness. So thank you for listening to me and may we leave this place tonight with the mindset of hopeful uncertainty, a greater imagination for the possibility of change and the peculiar versatility and readiness with which to achieve it.